today, and hopefully whoever's on the line can hear us, but the date today is October 26, 2021, and the time is 4.33 p.m. To ensure that we have a quorum present, I'm going to read out the names of the members of the Executive Committee, and if you are here, please, please say present. Richard Claypart, present. Colin Clark. Don Davison. Present. Uh, Cam Johnson. Present. Ed Tariak. Andrew McEwing. Lel Melville. Present. John McPherson. Present. James Fanton. Michael Stack. Present. John Becker. Present. Brian Box. Present. On video. Thank you, Ryan. Um, uh, thank you. I note here today that we have a quorum in the Executive Committee present, and I call to order this Executive Committee meeting of the Board of Education. And I was just going to make a comment before we get started on two things. One is, at least while I'm speaking, I'm going to take my mask off when I'm done speaking, and I will put it back on. And if you want to do the same thing, uh, feel welcome to do it. It's uh, easier to talk and maybe easier to hear. The second thing I want to mention uh, is before we get into our official business, I'd like to remind everybody of the email that uh, Gavin sent around launching the first ever annual fund. Uh, this was sent out last third, no, maybe last, sometime last I year. I both together, Richard. Yes, the, the age is kind of moved on. But um, it basically says that we're, we're trying to collect and, and Yavin and Deborah are, are giving us three easy options to, options to engage our list of individuals that we would like to solicit. And you know, you can either mail out the letter to yourself, or Uplift can mail them for you, or it can be done via email if that's where your contact is, is done. And all you need to do is let them know that that's which preference you have and which you know which contacts you would like to do. Um, we also, uh, and just so you know, I, I'm going to select option one, which means that I'm going to let Uplift do the communication um, uh, for, for my contacts. If you haven't already done so, please also know that uh, you know, which option you're going to pick. And then the committee, the development committee, Deborah, John Becker, Jasmine, and or members of the development committee will personally be reaching out to members of the board to discuss the, you know, your gift to the annual fund. And I think we've talked about it over a series of meetings, the importance of giving something that's meaningful to each of you. And we want to make sure that we end up with 100% board participation in a way to lead off the important fundraising vehicle for, for Uplift. And again, in, in making that comment, it's, it's really about the participation we're not really trying to pressure you on the amount. We'll have people giving at all different levels, but we would just like to make sure we get 100% participation. So, if there's not any questions, I'm going to. Uh, if there's any questions on that, those two topics. Okay. Seeing none, we have a full agenda this afternoon, so let's get started. Our first uh, item of business is the community forum, and I'll hand it over to Alex our uh, chief legal officer to manage that process. Yeah, we do not have any community speakers uh, this afternoon, so we can move on to information items. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the next order of business is the annual ESL board update and summer school recap from Stephanie Augenbach, Senior Director of Academic Support. Stephanie? Hey. Once you got the email, we'll also have them on the screen. So if you need a packet and want one, feel free to just raise your hand and I'll get it for you if you need it. Hey, Andre, welcome. Hi, everyone. I, uh, Carrie, I need to use the mic so that virtual can hear me. Okay, okay, got it. Um, so I'm going to be meeting with you today to talk a little bit about our programming that we do for our English learners across the network. Just a quick reminder. With our kiddos that are in primary, so pre-K through fifth grade, what we typically do is they go 
push in model. So you would see a support person in the classroom working directly with those English learners. With our secondary kids, so our middle school and high school, instead we use a pull out model where those kids are pulled out of class to work with a support person. So those are the two different models that you see on our upload schools. On the next slide, I just have some demographic information for you. Really all I've got here is head counts. A couple interesting things to point out. Can you next slide? Yes, please, yes. So you've probably got the head count on the paper in front of you. A couple of interesting things to point out. I think last year we had 35 different languages represented across the network. Our language diversity just continues to increase year over year, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, and certainly something that we don't see as much of in our ISD peers. They don't tend to have quite the language diversity that we have. Um, you'll also see really low identification numbers in pre-K and kindergarten. Nationwide last year, and certainly at Uplift, um, there was just lower enrollment in pre-kindergarten and kindergarten, which of course makes it more challenging for us to identify those English learner scholars, um, which makes me think that in a year or two, you're going to really see spikes there in first and second grade. Generally, ideally, what you want to see here is something like a bell curve, where you are identifying scholars as they get into maybe third, fourth, fifth grade, and then exiting them out of the program, and you see those numbers drop. So, just some context for you here. On our next slide, I'm starting to get into our scholar results. So our English learners take an assessment, a state assessment every year called TELPAS, that measures their language proficiency. They're scored on a couple of different skills. What I have here for you is our data on reading, speaking, and listening. What you'll see is that our reading scores actually slightly improved last year, or in the spring, but we had a drop off with our speaking and listening. When you think about scholars in a virtual environment, it like intuitively makes sense to you that kids have less experience with those skills, but it also concerns me a lot. And now that we're 100% back in an in-person environment, um, we really need to figure out a way to get those kids practicing on those speaking and listening skills. Um, and on a future slide, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we're going to try to do to address that decline. But it's definitely on my radar. It makes me nervous. On my next slide, I just have comparison data for you for all our scholars and then our English learners. So with all of our scholars, we saw a drop off in math. We see the same trend with our English learners. We don't see a bigger drop, right? They're dropping at the same rate as Gen Ed. Just something to note. The rest of the presentation I have for you is, I wanted to update you. Uh, when I met with you a year ago, I wanted to update you on what we've done. Um, I think the two biggest things I want to highlight here, we increased our percentage of ESL certified teachers by 20% over the past year which tells me that I have more teachers in front of kids with specific skills to support their English learners. So that was a big push by my team and they did a nice job with that. Frankly, I think training sessions being switched to virtual made that easier for some of our teachers to pursue that certification. And then the other thing I want to tell you is that we spent a lot of time thinking about staff capacity and, and where lines should fall. What we ended up doing was we added a fourth network level leadership role. So our English learner programming team now has a director just to advocate for those kids and their needs. We also shifted the way that our, our instructional staff reports. So at the beginning of this presentation, I talked about the support people that go into classrooms to support our English learners or pull them out. It used to be that those people reported up through ending at me, right? We have now shifted that so that those instructional support people report directly to the academic director at the campus, which I think gives the academic director like, the responsibility and autonomy to manage staff and schedules as best needed to support those English learners, and it just gives them 
a bit more time and contact with those staff members. As far as what we're going to do this year, so we are narrowing in on kindergarten, third grade, sixth grade, and ninth grade. We're calling that the focus four. We picked grades where we see high numbers of English learners and where we see transitions naturally happen. So as a child moves from fifth to sixth grade, you can imagine that the way they engage in their academics changes a lot. We want to make sure we're getting intentional support there. Um, we've been able to take our teacher and leader PD sequence that we have and integrate into the EL pieces into that. So it's like a coaching scope and sequence that follows along with the PD that the leaders and teachers are getting. Um, I already talked about that. And we can go to the next slide. We've invested in our partnership with Ensemble Learning. That's a group that was introduced to us as part of a seed grant. And they specifically focus on leader development with a lens for English learners. So for three years now, we've had a partnership where our academic directors have gotten explicit coaching on supporting those students. We've expanded that partnership to include the folks on my team, our campus coordinators, to give them the instructional support that they need to better support the English learners. Um, we talked about that decline that we saw in speaking and listening. So this is not, like as you might expect, this, ha this has happened at districts around um, the country. Like we're not isolated in seeing a decline in those verbal language skills. So one of the things that we are doing is we are introducing a new curriculum that focuses solely on the speaking and listening pieces. And I actually just had a competing vendor come to me last week offering to run it as well. So I now have two options that I can choose from, um, but it just narrows in on those skills, which I am very hopeful to see the payoff from that. The only other thing I would, I would highlight for you is that um, our ESL program requires some explicit parent and family engagement as part of Title III. We've typically done that on like the network scale. We have offerings from the network. We shifted it this year to do each campus gets to select what sort of parent and family engagement they want to see. Um, we figured that needs would just vary pretty widely by neighborhood and by parts of the Metroplex just based on impacts from COVID. So that's been something that's interesting. I think that's all I have for you in the deck. I would love to take any questions or feedback, comments, anything you have for me. Hi, yeah. Stephanie, is there an average time whenever an English learner is in the program? Is it? That's a great question. He asked if there's an average amount of time that an English learner should be in the program. I would say like three to five years is ideal. That is typically, if you have targeted instruction, enough to take the English learner from uh, a beginning level up to a proficient level, and then we exit them and they, they rejoin the general population, if you will. Um, at Uplift, we like to exit kids by fifth grade, if at all possible. Great question. Oh. Um, in terms of your staffing, is it is it supplementing teachers, or is it teachers that have this skill set that's a great question. So I have aides that supplement. Then I have specialized teachers that we call intervention specialists. Um, so I, kind of, I split the difference. And what you usually see is our primary and middle schools will have the specialized teachers, the interventionists. And our high schools, where there are lower numbers of English learners, we typically have the aides. So the 20% increase in staffing, is it, did your distribution correlate with this demographic here? So we had we have a 20% increase in the number of our teachers that are certified, which means of our teachers last year, 21% of them earned that certification. I didn't necessarily get to increase my staff. Does that make sense? They just earned so their certification. All of your staff is certified? That engage students? Not Gen Ed certified. They are um, Gen Ed certified. This is the additional ESL um, certification. 
that not all teachers are required to have. So this is an additional certification, but yes, like 90 plus percent of our teachers at Uplift are certified in a way you're thinking of it, Andre. This is an additional certification to support our English language work. And, and let me just follow up, I'm a son of two certified teachers. So yes. that's, that's, that's the reason for that question. <laughs> This is a brand new tool we are using this year around family engagement. 
We pivoted in September from only giving it to new families, which is what we're doing across the network, to in October giving it to everybody in Fort Worth, all of our families in Fort Worth. And I think positive's been a real strength for us because you can see in that data, families were super happy, and particularly our crescendo families who are brand new to the network. This is the first year for the school to be open. And when you saw another slide in the deck, it said, would you recommend uplift? Um, uh, and we had incredibly high scores, particularly at our three newest schools, Elevate High School, Ascend High School, and Crescendo. So POSIP was just, it's been real positive for us. We'll track it every month. You then saw this really complicated table for Gallup um, uh, of all of the staff culture data there, and that was a, a mixed range with a different kind of story under each. But what I would just headline there is, what our school leaders are coached to do, as we are in the central office, is when you get your data from Gallup, you then sit down with your staff, in this case teacher teams, and talk about the data with them, let, um, ask for feedback, try to get the qualitative that's driving the quantitative, and come up with an action plan. Um, we also are providing some technical support from Gallup for a few schools who need that. Um, around staff culture, and then we are asking our Fort Worth leaders, and also probably will ask all of our leaders to do this, um, to create their own mini pulse staff surveys throughout the year, um, so that way we can continue to track progress because we only give Gallup at the network level at the beginning at the end. And then lastly, from an academic standpoint, we just took the first quarter benchmark. You saw how the schools ranked. Um, uh, you know, the schools we are paying the closest attention to are Meridian Primary School, Mighty Middle School, Mighty High School. Everybody else has a path to get to where um, they need to be as well, those three schools as well. They just need a little bit more attention from all of us. Um, and then Remy and her team uh, launched a, a campaign called Fast Forward for Work. And basically what that is, it's a very detailed, integrated plan um, and we'll report back on how it's going. It just recently launched to basically align all network coordinated support. So we've got external consultants, principal coaches that are working at schools in Fort Worth. We have Lavinia doing curriculum support. We've got Remy's teaching and learning team giving support. And we wanted to make sure it was very clear who's on what point and that they all are working together. And so every Friday at 2 p.m., there's actually a standing data meeting for all the Fort Worth schools where they are giving a common mini assessment and from instruction that week, they're reviewing it and using it to inform instruction the next week. Um, and so that allows us to have a very close pulse on what is happening in our schools. So that's the headline on quarter one. I'm happy to flip to any page you want to dive deep on. Remy and Priscilla, is there anything I missed that you want to chime in on on Q1 and Fort Worth? Well, okay. Any questions about our Fort Worth schools performance in Q1? Okay, then I'm gonna go to our recommendation around this board committee. So Kira, if you want mine, flip them for me, please, a few ahead. So um, we would like to create a um, Upper Fort Worth advisory board and it basically at this level of a board committee, similar to audit governance development at that level of importance. What Deborah, and we can stay on this slide, Carrie, that's perfect. The next, um, can you go back? Yes, please, to um, uh, the executive summary slide, yeah, for that one. If, uh, oh, sorry, I don't know what happened. Oh, you have to go the other direction, sorry. Uh, so when Deborah and I are out in the community, and specifically in Fort Worth talking, it's one more slide after this, Carrie, please. Thank you. Um, you know, we have a couple of dynamics going on that we just want to openly name. Uh, Fort Worth is 22% of our K enrollment, right? Uh, it's a fifth of our network. But, um, and Fort Worth is like the 13th largest city in the US. But we are viewed as a Dallas-based organization with a Dallas board. Um, uh, and Fort Worth is an afterthought. Uh, and, uh, as, and that might have been fine a set of years ago, but now that there are new charter networks entering Fort Worth, as they enter, because there, many of them are coming from outside of our region, they have to have a Fort Worth board. Um, uh, and so they have boards, their boards are out meeting with people, um, you know, because they're in the heart of their early growth. So that makes sense. 
But that just shines a bright light on the fact that Uplift doesn't have that same presence. And Deborah and I are doing our best to be that present um, out in the community, as was well obviously Andre. Um, uh, but it's not enough. Um, uh, and so we feel it's really important uh, to make sure going forward that a completely different large city than Dallas to honor it, to have a board um, committee that meets in Fort Worth, that is run like a mini uplift board meeting. It is not a campus advisory council, which you all have like experienced in the past. You know, it will meet at the Fort Worth Central Office. Um, uh, Alex and I will run the meeting and plan for it with the chair of the committee, similar to how this meeting is run, um, with a focus on Fort Worth from people who live and work in Fort Worth. Um, and so we think that is super important uh, to it and, um, and will help not only like put stronger accountability on all of us, which we welcome, but also really make sure that we honor that we are a two major city portfolio of schools um, uh, and, and we need to, to make sure that there's some governance structure there. So it would literally serve as a board level committee uh, with the chair of that committee, just like audit governance, development, et cetera, real estate, who sits on the executive committee of, of this board. Um, so, uh, and that's pretty easy for us to do without any TEA approval to do so. So we are asking for approval of that in today's meeting so we can go ahead and get a chair lined up. We can start having conversations out in the community, bringing forward to the governance committee, uh, prospective members, obviously the governance committee is going to help us identify um, members as Andre will as well. So that is our recommendation and I'll pause there to see if there are any questions or Don, if there's anything you want to add as well. So, Don, do you want to add, I was just going to make one quick comment, which is we did present it to the governance committee uh, as, a, as a vehicle to get their blessing of what we're doing. I think the next step is, is once we establish it, then it's identifying all the members and putting it in place, which could take you know, six months or so. But it, in the meantime, the governance group has met with it. We vented a lot of the, the comments on the slide went through their review. So that's perfect. Okay. Yes, Are there questions about what work? This would be off the radar in terms of rules and regulation. Forum and minutes and because, sorry, that's a great question. So they do not have to be public open meetings because we would not have a quorum of the upper board executive committee, all of you, because only the chair would be a um, member of the executive committee. So that is a benefit is that they would run just like the finance committee doesn't have to be posted, doesn't have to be open public meeting. Um, uh, so, yes, that is a, definitely a difference that this board committee will have versus obviously our upward board. And that should hopefully help us with some board recruitment as well for this committee. Yes, I would, I would say uh, as a board, maybe there, there, there continues to be that Dallas Fort Worth piece. Mm -hmm. That won't ever change. Uh, and we're just subject to that because we've been in Fort Worth. We, uplift for 10 years now, from 11, I think. So that Dallas Fort Worth is always going to be there. And I'll tell you that growing up in Fort Worth. And, and so I think there continues to be challenges in the entire Fort Worth, city of Fort Worth, given that it's growing, but there's more pressure from economic development to, to have more density of, of, of families within 820. You know Fort Worth, you've got 820, right? So with the new mayor, we've had conversation that focusing on economic development within that 820 loop, which puts heightened awareness on education within that loop too. In, in 35, west and east of 35, two different worlds, totally. Uh, having gone to school on the west side myself, uh, we're pushing, when I say we, the community is pushing uh, to support all education within East Forward Hall, which includes up the, the philanthropic community. Uh, you know, they've got their pulse, uh, and we've had these conversations. And I think for us to have, 
to create a, an advisory, not CAC, but an advisory, shows that we're, we, that we're creating equity between Dallas and Fort Worth. And I think that's where the philanthropic community wants to see that. Uh, and, and it's no secret that you've got two former, a superintendent, a former superintendent, and a deputy superintendent that's now running Rocket Ship, which is the newest, which is the newest charter in Fort Worth. Ryan can't hear you, so Ryan can't hear you. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. It's okay. So you have. So our Rocket Ship. So Rocket Ship. And, and rocket Ship's board's getting the most. Yeah, and, and, and the, the entry of these new charters, and I've spoken to, and I've told you, yes, I get, a, I get a call about a new charter coming to Fort Worth all the time. So I talked to Rocket Ship. And quite frankly, you can be in who I am, I said, why are y'all coming to Fort Worth? You're, you're, West, you're West California. Why are you coming? And why are you coming at 287 East Berry? And they're like, where's that? That's where you're going. They didn't even know. And so it tells me that 4th ISD is really the challenge public school system in Fort Worth. They're having challenges. And the new legislature, Texas legislation, 38, 12, whatever it is, allows them to create quasi-charter type systems. And that's what they're, they're piecemealing off for the IC to charters throughout the country. Uh, Jack A, which is a ninth grade Dunbar, is now going to be run, I say, dually by two entities. Right? So you've got this fourth ISD monster of 86,000 students that is slowly being piecemeal off, slowly, day by day. I hate to say that, because my parents taught at fourth ISD. And so what we've got to do is have more presence. And I think this does that. Um, and I've talked to Yasmin about my you know, role in this, and I'm, I'm there. Um, and when I say I'm there, to, to, to participate whatever level. But I think the philanthropic community, and Deborah knows this very well, and I talk to the Pete Aarons, and I see him daily, John Robinson's and Morris's, and I can sense that there's that Dallas play, that you don't treat us like you do Dallas. And so I think this will help that. But I will always say the internal operation, the, the classroom is the key how we handle and execute in our classrooms. There's no, there's no equal to that other than perform. And so this is good, but we've still got to perform. So yeah. again, I support. We all understand. We still yeah, have to yeah, perform. We're yeah, yeah. And, 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 and I said that in closing, trying to get new council people. Um, we've got relationships, as Yasmin knows, but we've got to perform. Um, but I support this move. So let me know in Fort Worth. Uh, Michelle and I, we've talked to Vincent and others, so I do support this, this uh, move of additional oversight, governance, if you will, um, in that regards, and what we're doing here.
And uh, we put it on yellow because cash flow liquidity is no longer growing like it has been for several years. Now that uh, you know, we still have the additional cash outflow of expenses of opening up schools and sections combined with more debt service, uh, our cash is, is, uh, is flat this year mainly. Uh, it would be a little bit down if we didn't have a chance to draw on the line for some property. Uh, amended expense budgets that you're going to see, uh, they're down as the schedule shows from 278 million to 240, 270 million. But I think the, as you will see, the biggest expense item that's being reduced is one that we wish we did not have to reduce, and that is we have a lot of uh, vacancy rates in their schools of teachers and staff. So that's why this is on yellow. It's a cost reduction, but it's not a good one necessarily. So most of what we want to discuss about today is the amended budget. And uh, top we show, we show how enrollment is off over what we presented in June, and also that projected ADA, which is with attendance, is off by 18, 1,848 kids. That uh, scholars that reduces revenue from the state by approximately 20, 20 million dollars. Um, as you can see on the bottom, though, we pick it up in federal revenues because uh, what we're doing is drawing more ESSER. Um, I'm living in the past because it's audit time, and an uh, interesting thing that came to my mind today when I was looking at this year's audit is 2020, we had $19 million of federal expenses, uh, federal revenue, excuse me, in 21, it went up to 25, and you can see here towards the bottom, uh, we're going to draw $57 million of federal funds this year in order to, to meet this amended budget. So it's quite a bit of growth in a different pot of money than what we're used to with state funding. The next page on the expense side, you can see the top line is where most of the expense savings that we see are coming from. The first line is personnel. We have budgeted vacancy rate at 9%. We're currently at 9.3%. Um, unless if you have any other questions, I won't go over into the detail of the, the various expense items. But as you can see, 6.2 out of 7.8 in total expense reduction is in the personnel line. So overall, on the next page, what this means is our net revenues were 15.2 in our adopted budget. We're, at, we're asking on this amended budget, we think they're going to be, net revenues are going to be 13.752. So they go down by 1.3 with additional interest expense, our coverage ratio and the reduction in net revenue, our debt coverage ratio, we project to be uh, 1.25 down by down from 1.32, but 1.25 is still far ahead of our debt covenant of 1.1x. So I have one more page and then we can go on the budget. First look at cash flow. Uh, we talked about this on the first page. It's, uh, you know, we started the year, ended last year at 52.5 million. Bottom right hand corner, you see 53.5 million. So it goes up by a million, but in the middle of the page where you see no draw is 6 million. So that means we're drawing money from the bank, and that's for the new Luna land and the cost that we have in it now once we. It's approved by the city. We, we're going to yeah, short-term borrow the money on a note draw from the bank, and then ultimately uh, either use the proceeds from the, from the sale of existing building or bonds. So with that, I'm done. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Not uh, is there a motion to approve the resolution approving the uh, budget for fiscal 2022 as presented? Thank you, Michael. Is there a second? Second. Oh, thank you. Are there any votes against the motion? Hearing none, the motion is approved by a unanimous vote. Uh, at this point, the board may elect to retire to a closed session to conduct a private consultation with its attorney pursuant to Government Code 551.071, deliberate the purchase exchange. The board will now retire to closed session to conduct a private consultation with its attorney pursuant to Government Code 551.071.
Government Code 551.071 annual review rate. The employment, uh, appointment, employment, evaluation, reassignment duties, discipline or, uh, or dismissal of the public officer pursuant to Texas Government Code 551.074. I ask everyone to please exit the room for virtual meeting except for the board members. Time is now 5.14 and the board is in closed session. At this time, the board has returned to open session. The time is now 6.11. I note that the same quorum of the board is present. Uh, no decision or action was taken by the board during the closed session. session. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the CEO compensation benefit plan as presented? So moved. I second. Um, are there any votes against the motion? Hearing none, the motion is approved by unanimous vote. Yeah, I just want to thank you all for staying a little extra later. I know it's past 6 o'clock, which we normally would like to conclude by, but since there's no further uh, pending business before the board, this meeting is hereby adjourned. The time is now 6.11 p.m.